start by having you tell us your name and spelling it. I'm Irene LaViolette. And how do you spell that? Can you spell your name? I-R-E-N-E V, middle initial, La Violet, L-A, capital V-I-O-L-E-T-T-E. Great. Uh, and today's date is February 13, 2013. Uh, my name is Cindy Kelly, and we're here at the offices of the Atomic Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C. Um, can you tell me what does the V stand for, your middle name? for my Greek name, Vuches, last name. How do you spell that? V-O-U-T-S-A-S. -S. So you have a Greek maiden name. That's and right. Where did you grow up? I was born in Manhattan, and at the age of, uh, I just had finished kindergarten, my mother took us to Greece to visit her parents. And we were going to spend just summer there, a few months in the summer. But my father realized that the economic conditions in the United States was not so good. So he wrote to mother to wait not to return immediately until he, he, she hears from him. And it turned out that um, his decision was for mother to stay and to see whether she can build a house in the lot she owned. And he stayed two more years in the States to send some money. And believe it or not, he pulled out from New York just before the crash. So we were very lucky to have a nice childhood in Athens. We attended, uh, my brother and I, private schools. And um, I was, uh, I had finished second year in the chemistry school when the war broke out, when Mussolini uh, sent the ultimatum to, for uh, Greece to surrender. And uh, that was the time that uh, our, uh, in Greece, the dictator Metaxas uh, answered, no, Oshi. So the universities closed, the fellows went up the front, and Irene had to find something worthwhile to do. So in the beginning I was um, I, in a, a recreational Red Cross group visiting hospitals, and later on, I realized that wasn't enough contribution, and I signed up for a nursing course, volunteer nursing home. And um, upon finishing my training, I was assigned to a military hospital, which fortunately was not too far from my home. It was the Polytechnic of Athens, converted to the 13th Military Hospital. It seems to me that the number 13 follows me, 13 <laughs> Military Hospital. When I left Greece it was 13 of August, today is 13 <laughs> of February. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, so uh, I served as a uh, volunteer nurse under the supervision of a registered nurse up to the time that Greece had to surrender to the Germans and Italians, at which point 
they ordered the head of the Red Cross, Mrs. Mesolora, to evacuate the hospital and just uh, to take over the hospital for their wounded and they even wanted the nurses to stay on. But of course, I wasn't, I was a volunteer, so I made a movement for other volunteers not to stay on and uh, our wounded, most of them came from up north and the railroad lines were uh, all um, broken up from uh, uh, because of the war and they couldn't uh, travel back home so it was a very pitiful sight to see the streets of Athens full of wounded soldiers and most of them because of the weather conditions up north where they were fighting they had frostbites and their uniform didn't help the circulation in the legs the old-fashioned way was uh, uh, the legs to be bandaged with khaki, that type of uniform. So many of my wounded were amputated and uh, they w uh, I was uh, there receiving wounded directly from the front and many times I wouldn't even have a day off. So it was very pitiful, that experience. And um, after I, in April 1941, uh, when uh, uh, the Germans invaded, I uh, uh, just uh, was around trying to come to normal uh, living, but really I couldn't. It was very fortunate that um, uh, the American Embassy sent a letter to my parents that they, they are going to have a group repatriated to the States and actually we didn't know who would be in the group and if I would like to join and I had to pay, uh, my parents had to pay my ticket as as far as Lisbon, where we'll use um, a airline and train, and uh, uh, the travel will include air and train. And in Lisbon, we would expect to have someone from the States to pay the rest of the boat ticket. So my parents. Uh, uh, were um, quiet, undecided, but I told them I like to go back. I was the only daughter, and my brother, who was two years younger, two and a half younger than me, had just left uh, Greece 24 hours before the the declaration of the surrender and he was caught in 
Rome. He left under normal conditions with a, a Greek passport. And at that point, when he heard the news, he put away his Greek passport and traveled the rest of his trip on the American passport. So since he arrived in the States, we hadn't heard from him. And um, my mother and dad uh, submitted to my wishes to go hoping that I'll be a good company to my brother too. So that was how I came to the States and I had a wonderful group. We were living on um, uh, Italian, Alitalia. They would offer us once a week only five seats so the group had to assemble somewhere. So for a time they will gather in uh, Rome and when it was a big enough group, they'll go as far as uh, Lisbon by train. Um, so that's how uh, all together, the group wasn't too big, uh, maybe 60 or, or 70. And head of the repatriation group was Mr. Laird Archer, foreign director of the Near East Foundation. Upon arrival in Lisbon, they, oh, when I arrived in, uh, in uh, Rome, I checked the uh, departure of the boat uh, from Lisbon to, this, to New York, and I would have missed it by hours if I had continued the, the route that I had to take. The route was definite, um, assigned by the repatriation group. So when I arrived in, uh, by train in uh, Switzerland, I had enough money, f uh, spending money my parents had given me, so I decided it would be a great, a great thing if I can exchange the train route between uh, Madrid and Barcelona by air. And that little change would bring me to Lisbon uh, in time to live with the rest of the group. And when I arrived in Lisbon, Everybody was very, very happy that I made it, and they told me I was covered with black soot because the trains those times they were using coal. So the first thing they did to me was to uh, uh, take me to the laboratory and wash out the black soot and said, now we are going to celebrate. So before we had anything else, uh, before we did anything else, they suggested we'll go to a bullfight. So uh, that's how the night before departure I spent. And I arrived in New York on uh, Labor Day uh, and my brother, uh, my cousin was also first cousin, our mother's uh, sisters, was in the group too. And he had sent a, from Lisbon a te telegram 
to uh, uh, his cousin that he's coming. And in the same uh, telegram, we included to let them, uh, my brother know that I am arriving. But somehow it got a little mixed up. My cousin's last name was Alex. And uh, my brother's first name, Alex. So somehow they interpreted the message in a different way. And my brother didn't have any idea I was arriving. So I went with my cousin to his cousin, and then we let my brother know. What are you going to do now? You know, they had uh, also the cousin was single. Uh, they thought, you know, I'll settle for a matrimonial thing. I said, I'm going to continue my education. I had brought all my transmit at, uh, and uh, transcript, and uh, the first thing I want to go was to Barnard College, uh, Columbia. And after uh, a few weeks, I heard of them that I was accepted as a, an unclassified student. And that's how I got to Barnet in 1943. I graduated made, uh, from Barnet, uh, majoring in, uh, in chemistry. And the next thing I did was headed for Niagara Falls, New York, when I had a job with the DuPont Electrochemicals Department Research Lab. And I thought I was very fortunate to land a job the type that I wanted because I had offers for control work around New Jersey, New York, and so on. It was right after the war, so jobs were plentiful. But during, uh, to, during, uh, during the war. Uh, during the war. During the war, yeah. So that's how I got to Niagara Falls DuPont. And um, shortly after I was there, about a month at uh, YMCA, I met uh, a young professionals group, International Relations. I met Fred LaViolette, uh, who was with DuPont, physicist, chemist, and instrumentation uh, since 1940. I went there in 1943. Well, uh, we, uh, it didn't take too long to start a relationship with Fred, and within a month he proposed to me. And at that point, uh, we planned to get married, and soon we had to wait because he was selected to participate in the Manhattan Project, and uh, which would had taken him for special training in Delaware. So in um, February 1944, he left Niagara Falls for um, Delaware. And when he came back, we got married in May 28, 1944. We didn't have much time 
We just took a honeymoon weekend, the train trip to New York. Actually, we stayed at St. Moritz Hotel and headed back to Niagara Falls to board the train for out west. And I remember passing uh, lovely places, and one of them was the Grand Canyon going through uh, Colorado. And we arrived in uh, Richland, Washington, sometime in June 1944. Upon arrival, housing was not uh, ready. So we had to split in different quarters, men and women, so-called barracks, and had to wait for the uh, housing. Being just a couple, we were assigned a prefab, one-bedroom prefab. The ones with families, they were assigned um, houses. And we were very fortunate after a, at least a month, we had to wait to have a prefab in the last row. So it was really nice, um, although in the desert, a closed house can get uh, very hot, but that's one thing we were doing after work. The first thing we were doing was to wash down with water the roof to cool it off and we'll sit outside and enjoy a refreshing highball while watching the lovely sunsets. The, it was really desert uh, and sage was the only plant you could see around and I was lucky that I saved some of the papers uh, that uh, was published weekly, Sage Sentinel. So Sage, double meaning <laughs> for that. And I'm going to donate the papers, weekly papers, to your organization that it's a mirror of the life there. And I'll tell you that um, for a, a community of very interesting people, we didn't get bored at all because we would entertain among ourselves. We'll play games of charades progressive dinners, and then they would organize square dances and other dances, lectures, uh, mainly on topics of safety and health. And sometimes we would go to nearby Spokane to visit, and that's about it, about life there. Is it anything else uh, you want to hear? I took too much time. No, not a bit, not a bit. That's fascinating. Um, so what was your, what did you do at Hanford? What I did there was, um, of course I wasn't in the secret. You see, I got reinstated out west and uh, my work was, um, different one. First, I worked at the control lab analyzing the Columbia River water. Some other time, I worked for a physicist using the polarograph for analysis. And another job I had, I was given the job of uh, 
checking the new Geiger counters that they had come in for background count, Geiger counters that uh, measures gamma rays. That's about it. What do you remember about, um, what did you learn from these measurements about the radioactivity in the environment? Was it there, what, were there high levels of radiation you found or low levels? Did you detect any change from? Uh, you mean uh, in, in my analysis? In the water, yeah. In the water? Well, uh, we were not told. Uh, we were just doing the analysis and uh, keeping track. So you just you monitored uh, the Columbia River water from various points. Other people uh, from would... various right. points. Right. Um, now, Fred was in the, I was in the 300 area, as we were saying, and um, Fred's work, top secret, was um, in 200 area. So, uh, the 200 area, of course, is the sep chemical separations. That's where they were taking the spent fuel rods and and extracting the plutonium. Is that what? Yeah. Well, one of Fred's uh, significant contributions was um, uh, in solving a problem they had with the encasing the plutonium. A, a group at Hanford they. Uh, wanted to uh, put the plutonium in uh, a plutonium slugs in aluminum uh, cans and seal them in solder but uh, uh, one of the problems they had was uh, as soon as they will seal them with solder and place them in the molten solder, the, the, the aluminum will melt. So Fred's observation was that uh, a solution can be found by trying to do the process as soon as possible. So the aluminum would not have time to melt and that's what that group emphasized and practice on the time they should finish the operation and they finally were successful and they were able to because uh, they had to put it in a sealed uh, uh, case as uh, plutonium is very inflammable in air, the air we breathe. Right. Are you, you're talking about the uh, uranium that they put in these aluminum cans before they put it in the reactor, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to say that? Or just to say it again and, and use the word uranium. I think it's, they were canning uranium oh, as, the, as the fuel, right? Oh, was that? They, they were canning uranium and they put it in the slugs of uranium in the case and uh, they will seal it with um, uh, solder. So by doing this, Quickly enough, they were able to finish this operation successfully. And that yeah. was so critical. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's wonderful. That's great. Um, 
Let's see. Well, you both were involved in very interesting things. But you, did you talk to each other? Could you, could you tell Fred about what you were doing and could Fred... I, I, he knew what I was doing, but I did, never knew what he was doing. Uh, because he was uh, on secret. Uh, how about um, how about your friends? Did you know? Did you have a good time living there? Was there other people in your situation, your about your age, doing similar things? Was it a fun community? Uh, uh, when you say whether my friends were doing similar things. Uh, living, living in there, Ireland. Those the ones that have, did you make friends? Oh, of course we made friends. Yes. Uh, and uh, we kept uh, in touch afterwards. I, upon uh, uh, Fred's, uh, Fred's work, uh, lasted eight months from uh, uh, June 1944 to March 6, 1945. And then we headed back to Niagara Falls to DuPont. You see, DuPont at that time was operating Hanford for the government. Later on, they changed. At one time, GE was running it. And um, on the way back, we took the Sunlight Limited train, coastal train to California. And that's how we came back through after visiting California and San Francisco, it was really nice. And, and uh, I guess I covered everything, eh? Huh? You did a great job that, uh, you know, maybe there's some other things you oh, remember uh, you want to... What else do you want me to talk about? Just what it was, what you felt like. What was it like to arrive in this desert? Yeah, well, uh, I I I enjoyed myself. I uh, we made new friends, um, and I liked my work. What was it like working for Dupont? Working for DuPont? You mean uh, back in Niagara Falls? Well, was DuPont a good company to work for? Oh, uh, I think it's a great company to work for. Uh, uh, your efforts is, uh, are always appreciated and you had freedom of uh, in the research department, of course, they should. And my work uh, was of different kinds in Niagara Falls, um, trying to use the products that they, they make. They use the electric... Um, Power from the from the from the falls to separate metals like uh, uh, sodium and lithium from its salts, and um, so uh, one way for their uh, uh, to uh, of their business is their customers uh, can improve their uh, products by us using uh, the metals that they are produced by this electrolysis. 
like um, at one time I was doing a project for Procter and Gamble, and uh, I was using uh, linseed oil to hydro hydrogenate it, and uh, this way they can use it to make soap. Um, another time I was working on dyes and different types uh, of things. Um, you want to talk about dad's work there? Well, uh, the, uh, my husband, who was uh, hired at uh, uh, DuPont in Niagara Falls as a physicist, chemist, and instrumentation, uh, he He was um, in process control for the heavy chemical uh, production. And he developed methods for locating hazardous ground faults on multi-megawatt electrolytic cell banks, measuring dangerous levels of chlorinated hydrocarbon vapor in work areas, the production of um, high, dielect high K dielectric capabilities for the Air Force. And Fred developed um, a machine for workers to check their rubber gloves for holes. So the, that was one of the things he did. Well, good. Um, I have talked to other people who have worked on sort of environmental monitoring from DuPont, and they give DuPont a lot of credit for sort of being one of the first companies to really care whether the environment is okay, whether they're st stressing it or, or uh, contaminating. Uh, oh yeah, uh, very, very safety conscious, yeah. And uh, out west, a lot of the lectures were on safety, lectures open to the community. What, did they did they talk to you about radiation, about hazards you might have from radioactive materials? Well, we were uh, uh, were in um, a, a monitor, which uh, upon uh, uh, leaving the plant you had to leave it. So they they measured how you know, yeah. the doses that that you might have received. Yeah. So, I don't remember any incidents of hazardous uh, radiation. Let's see what else. Um, do, you, do you remember uh, at the 300 area, was there a reactor there with a big silver dome? I don't remember. I don't remember. Yeah, they just took that down. It had become an icon for the community. Really? It was just very sad. They took it down. Um, your your house that you lived in, did it, it had a flat roof? Is that flat a, roof? Did they call it a flat top? Flat you know, top. Did the, the name? Did they? Did some people call them a flat top? I don't remember. I don't remember. Because I think in Oak Ridge they had the very same... But it was very interesting inside. You know, one bedroom, the kitchen and living room was open. We had just the built-ins that were necessary. Now what about... Um, I hear a lot about the dust and the wind. 
Oh yeah, uh, in the desert you do get uh, sometimes these winds. I know because I had a, a chance to spend some time in another desert with Fred at Saudi Arabia. So uh, later on, we were there in Saudi Arabia from. 1980 um, to the end of 88, up to 89. Uh, he was with the University of Minerals, Petroleum and, Minerals. Petroleum and Minerals at the Research Institute there. Dahran. In Dahran. In Dahran, yeah. So, so comparing two deserts, which, is, which was windier? Over there is much worse the the wind storms. In Saudi, yeah. In Saudi, is worse. Do you remember the tumbleweed? The tumbleweed, the plants that that kind of get carried by the wind and roll. Oh yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, what about shopping? You said you. Go to Spokane, or what did you do if you needed to shop for? Sometimes we would go to Spokane. I also was able to go to Seattle once with a group of girls. They had, one of them had a friend in the Navy who invited us. So. Fred wasn't able to go. So did you drive? How did you get to Seattle? I don't re really remember who drove, uh, but I remember I was so impressed by Seattle. That nice contour, hilly. Do you remember? Can you do you remember any more of your train ride from Niagara Falls to Richland? I guess you went to. You told me you went to Albuquerque. I mean, was it uh, full of soldiers, or was the train uh, take several days? What's that? Mm -hmm. No, she doesn't remember. She remembers the Grand Canyon. That's oh, all. Yeah. The trip on the way back was more pleasant. Oh, oh yeah. She, you had a name for that train. What was it called, that train? I did say Sunlight Limited. Yeah. yeah. And uh, in uh, San Francisco, we rode the streetcar and looked around. It was so interesting, San Francisco. And, uh, wow. Well, you've had quite a well-traveled life. She didn't tell you that she caught a German spy in Greece before she left. Oh my. Yes. And she also, I don't know if you understood that when she was, uh, when the Germans took over the hospital, she actually led a... Um, I did say. Yes. Well, it wasn't in that much detail. Um, she went around to the home of each volunteer nurse and said, look, we're volunteers, you don't have to go. So they didn't show up, it was a strike. And later, when my mom was in the States, the Germans came to my grandparents' house looking for her, four times. And my grandmother held it a secret all her life until she, when she died at, at 94 or something. A few years later, she told us, because she didn't want my mother to be upset about it or something. Okay. So she never mentioned her. it. She wow. never mentioned it, yeah. But yeah, they were looking for her because she was, you know. <laughs> a troublemaker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, she saw, tell the story about the German spy, Mom. That's so well, interesting. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it was the time that I, wa <clears throat> I wasn't a nurse anymore. I just um, uh, followed uh, a, Nun. She was dressed as a nun, and I thought she was walking kind of funny. And she sensed that I followed her, 
and she tried to stop window shopping <coughs> in one of the main streets of Athens, <coughs> past a theater, a movie theater, and I stopped too. <laughs> and it was getting kind of dark, and I wasn't going to be late going home, so I told a policeman that uh, I don't have any clues except that uh, this person seemed to me a little suspicious and I want you to let you know. And he took my name and address and telephone number and that's how they notify my, my home that indeed she was a spy. Hey, you had the wrong job. It's <laughs> <laughs> been in counter espionage, clearly. One thing that uh, people are inter interested in women and science. So you were a chemist, and you obviously had very responsible jobs at at Hanford. Looking back over your career, were you happy to be uh, a chemist, uh, a scientist? Yeah, oh yeah, very much so. Okay. I was very happy to be a scientist, yeah. What made you want to be a scientist in the first place? I did, and when I told my mother I'm going to study chemistry, she was a little speechless because she was just the opposite. She was uh, a, a woman of the literature and as a matter of fact, when she finished high school, she was offered a scholarship to go abroad to Alexandria, Egypt through a scholarship of a magazine, a little encyclopedia type, and uh, my grandfather didn't let her go at those times, you know, because of that. So she knew mythology from A to Z, the Bible, that type of mind she had different than me. How about your father? Was he a scientist? No, he wasn't a scientist. Um, he was a hotel man. When he was in the States, he worked for the Commodore and the World of Astoria. He was a host. Now I'm going to switching back a little bit. What about, or maybe I should pursue this one more question. Um, what did you like about chemistry? What what made you, with no parent having any, you know, profession in that field, what made you want to be a chemist? Well, really, what made me choose chemistry? Uh, maybe uh, well, young people uh, try to figure out what the, their abilities are and I figure that uh, I can count on my memory and uh, uh, Maybe I admired someone else who was a chemist. Uh, Madame Curie, maybe? Usually that's the case at that age. Maria Fleming, was huh? she then? Was she I had borrowed uh, from the States um, my cousin's cousin, where we stayed the fir first day of arrival in the States, 
I had borrowed, uh, she, she was a chemist, and I had borrowed uh, Conant's chemistry book, organic chemistry. Uh, and he had uh, actually sent me one as a present while we were in Greece, while I was uh, a student at the university there. So this was James S. Conant? He was the president the of Harvard. And ironically, he was head of the, um, or a key advisor to President Roosevelt on the Manhattan Project. Yeah, so and I know. see that uh, right across the street where I was attending Barnett, a lot of work was done on the cyclotron, and I just was reading it. Yeah. And one thing I can tell you, um, when I was in Niagara Falls after the, uh, graduation, uh, the head of the repatriation committee, Laird Archer, nearest foreign director, nearest foundation, he was assigned just before the end of the war in Greece to become the head of UNRWA, United Nations Rehabilitation Reconstruction. And he called me or wrote to me if I would like to go back with a group, his group, UNRWA, to Greece. And I thought it over, and my decision was, no, I won't. I'll stay in the States. And I had met Fred already. So that... Because you felt you'd given your word to Fred. Yeah, well, I didn't want to go back. So tell me, um, if, if you can remember, your first reaction, stepping off the train in the first couple of days in the desert of Richland. Well, I'm a type that I adjust easily. So, well, it, it, of course, it must have been a surprise, but it didn't take me long to adjust. I'm not the type, you know, some people cannot adjust, and they are very, very miserable. Fortunately, I'm not that kind. I can adjust to any conditions. You're blessed. Yeah. That's a great blessing. Yeah. And in Saudi Arabia, everybody hears Saudi Arabia. Well, we had great time, the women there. They couldn't drive. They had to wear long things, but... Not them. really. I, they weren't so strict in the 80s. Later on, uh, things became very tough. But in the 80s, it was the golden age. And well, that's wonderful. Really, you've been terrific. When I arrived, my my brother was attending Columbia at night and he was working at the Grumman Aircraft in Long Island. So he was living because of, uh, of his job at Long Island. He was living at Bethpage, Long Island. And when I arrived, and I was accepted at the Barnet. 
we decided to look for a small room. It, but it turned out it had to be a big room with kitchen uh, uh, near Barnet on Broadway. Uh, something like uh, 100 and uh, 30, Barnet is 116, and <clears throat> we will make a two room, separating the one room by a blanket. So this way, uh, my brother was uh, with me and he had to travel and to make extra money I looked for a job in teaching Greek and I was uh, offered a job at the, uh, one of the churches and at one time I had to travel quite far I, I think it was Brooklyn, but fortunately that wasn't too, for too long. Then I was um, uh, more fortunate to find a job in uh, Washington Heights in New York, which was closer. And I had to go to Barnet when all of a sudden uh, in uh, midterm, I heard that they are going to give me assistance uh, in the tuition. So that helped. And um, by the end of 1941, I was notified. Uh, after uh, two midterms, that uh, the next semester of 1942, I'll be given a full scholarship, a residence, and uh, tuition, everything. So that was a good timing because my brother was looking to start studies at uh, RPI, the Rensselaer Polytechnic, and when his final uh, acceptance came through, uh, he left for uh, uh, Troy, New York, with a major aeronautical engineer. So the timing was good, but while we were uh, uh, at the one-room apartment. I really was responsible for a little hand washing for both of us, a little cooking. I had the job, I had the, the classes to attend. It was two hard months, but I made it. My brother, Alex Vuches, uh, in his thesis, he uh, talked about the twisted ribbon. And that twisted ribbon uh, was used by the astronauts landing in the moon. And that's why he's recognized and his name is at the Smithsonian Institute.